most of us can. Uh, it, it's really our story. Um, I think it's, it's, really fast, it's really fascinating and amazing to be part of a, a story that is bigger than just Weavertown or just, you know, the last 50, 100 years or whatever. Uh, I remember Alan Roth tells the story of, of driving in New York City with, uh, with, with a, a taxi, and, the, and he was trying to share Christ with the taxi driver, and the taxi driver said, he was angry, he said, in that name they killed my ancestors. And Alan hadn't prepared this, but he just responded sort of spontaneously and said, in that name they killed mine too. <laughs> and, and, and he said, who are you? The taxi driver said, who are you? And he opened up a door. Uh, knowing our story, I think, can, can create opportunities to, uh, to share, to, to connect with people in different ways. <clears throat> um, I don't know if I'll review a lot of what, uh, what John shared, but I, I thought he gave us a, a good overview. How do, you, how do you study church history in a few hours? It's difficult. But uh, jumping into the Reformation period, I know he talked some about a few figures last evening. Uh, some of the, 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 the things, I, I wanna try to set a bit of a background to the Anabaptist movement. I think understanding what was going on in the time may help us understand uh, the significance of it. Um, the, so first of all, John touched on this quite a bit, how the church, uh, the Catholic church, had really gained a lot of power. Now. Uh, they, so we talked about Constantine, remember Constantine and the Council of Nicaea and how Constantine then basically legalized Christianity or made it somewhat a, a state religion. Uh, it wasn't enforced right away, but eventually uh, things, basically you, were, you almost had to be a Christian. Uh, and so Christianity was defined by territory, all right? Not by commitment or not by life. So we think this is normal. We think the way we live is normal. We think America is normal, right? Everybody decides where they want to go to church, and we you know, follow Jesus kind of in the way that we feel most comfortable with. Well, it, it wasn't always that way. In fact, the interesting thing about that idea is that it, it was actually the Anabaptists who came up with that idea and said, this is how it should be. Uh, and I was actually studying at Hack with a professor uh, who was very, uh, how could you say, certainly didn't uh, fear God very much at all. Um, he, would, he was an interesting professor, uh, or not in a nice kind of way, but he would just say crazy things and, and curse and swear and whatever in class. He used to say that uh, uh, he was an anarchist, basically, and he would, he would get his students to vote for him in presidential elections because he said, you know, okay, bring the whole system down. But uh, he recognized the influence of the Anabaptists in shaping the American uh, system uh, of separation of church and state. It was very, the Anabaptists were the first people talking about those kind of ideas. Uh, but, but okay, so they're, but they are, they are uh, living in this environment where the state and the church have now become very tightly intertwined. Now, I would like, maybe we can go back to Constantine uh, and John may have touched on this some, so I, I don't think we can quite say that Constantine married, it, or the, the church and the state married immediately. It was maybe more of a dating period, and, and slowly but surely uh, things got tighter and tighter, to the point where the church was very powerful. Uh, in fact, they controlled the state, or they were, they, uh, there was a time when the popes were more powerful than the, the, uh, the kings or the emperors or the, the rulers. Um, the, the, and, and so the, the popes had incredible power. Now, one thing I want to touch on is the, the, the whole idea of transubstantiation, which is kind of a big word, which we probably uh, don't understand too much. But it, it's the, the Catholic view that when the mass is served, uh, when the communion is served, it becomes the literal body and blood of Jesus, right? And then... As people partake of that, it, it, uh, it gives divine grace. It, the, the grace comes through the sacraments, right? So the it, gra grace comes through actually eating these things. And you're actually, in their mind, they're eating the, the body and blood of the Lord. 
Um, in fact, in, in Catholic churches, when I was studying at Faith Builders once, Steve Russell took us to a Catholic service. It was, it was interesting, uh, the way they talked about things, but uh, they, had a, they had a separate sink where they washed out the, uh, the uh, what do you call it, cups and whatever that, that had the emblems, because they didn't want to be washing out the blood and body of Jesus into the sewer. And so they had a separate sink where they washed those things so they wouldn't go out with you know, all the other waste. Uh, but this, okay, so this is very significant. Why is this significant? Why is transubstantiation and the, the, the grace that's brought through that significant? Any, any ideas? Why is that so significant? Why was it so significant? Still is to Catholics. Any ideas? What do you think? Okay, there we go, exactly. So uh, who can serve the, the, the communion meal? Who, who can do that? It's only the clergy, right? The, the leaders, the, the people at, at the top. The, and not anybody can turn the body or the bread and blood into the body and blood of Jesus. I don't, you know, there's something happens when they, um, when they I, I don't know what they do. Um, but it gives the people that, that control that, uh, that uh, sacrament incredible power. So they had the power um, of people's souls, basically, in their own hands. So um, I think it's a significant thing to think about because in Catholicism, uh, uh, reaching God comes through the clergy, in a sense. Uh, we typically would think that we... I think there's a difference in the way that we understand coming to God. As Anabaptists, I think we would, uh, at least in practice, think of coming to God as a community together in brotherhood. In Catholicism, it's much more coming through the clergy. And the clergy held that power through uh, controlling the emblems, the sacraments. Um, the Pope had incredible power. So the Pope was on the top of the Catholic Church. And his power uh, was, was greater than anyone. Um, and so basically, it came down to if you, were on, if you were on the right side of the church, then you had hope for salvation. If you were on the wrong side or you got excommunicated, then, then you were damned and there was no other way. I mean, you had to, you know, there was, there was only one way uh, to be right with God as they understood it. Um, so the Pope, Gregory, one of the emperors said this, the successor of Peter is the vicar of Christ. He has been established as a mediator between God and man, below God, but beyond man, less than God, but more than man, who shall judge all and be judged by no one. So that's the Pope. Uh, Pope popes had power over kings. They... Uh, one, another one said that the Pope is like the sun, while kings were like the moon, just like the moon reflects the light of the sun, so kings receive their power from the Pope. So again, the, the Pope had the power. The kings were actually, in a sense, under, under the uh, authority of the Popes. Um, some other things, okay, so back to the, the, the power thing. So if you got excommunicated from the church, uh, you were not only excommunicated from the church, you were excommunicated from society. I mean, everything was, you know, integrated together. You were, if you, if you uh, got in trouble with the church, it was a big deal. Um, another thing that uh, had happened quite a, a few hundred years before the, uh, the, the Reformation started was the Crusades. Um, and the Crusades, I, we can't spend much time there, but the Crusades were horrible. I mean, they were just terrible. Um, there was, the Christians went, the, the Pope called the Crusades and told people that if they go on this crusade and if they die in battle, they're gonna get, they're gonna get a, a ticket straight to heaven. Um, and, and so thousands and thousands of people went on the, the, the Crusades. There was, I think, four or five, I forget exactly how many, maybe seven Crusades, uh, one crusade. And so, so people went to free the Holy Land from the, the control of the Muslims, of the infidel. Um, and the stories are just tragic. I mean, they're, they're horrible stories of just killing people and the, the descriptions that the people of that time gave are, uh, are shocking. Um, and they did this all in the name of Jesus. 
There was actually one crusade that was a children's crusade. They thought, you know, Jesus would protect the children, and so they sent the children in battle, and of course they all died. Uh, but the crusades were, were Christians going to free the Holy Land, Jerusalem, Israel, from the control of the Muslims. Another thing that, uh, another significant event around that time was the Black Death. And I don't even know the exact dates, but the Black Death, uh, it was, it was uh, some sort of a, what do you call it? Disease or something that was going around just killing people, lots and lots of them. Uh, in some areas, a fourth of the population died. So there was mass, massive amounts of people dying. Um, and you, you imagine what that would do with a society if a fourth of the people in Lancaster County would just die, um, that would probably get people thinking, or get people. It would it would stir the pot. It would it would uh, it would change. I don't know. It would do something. And in that era, I don't know what it did. You know, with people, I'm guessing. You know, they're thinking. Wait a minute. Here, what's wrong? What's the curse? Why is God allowing this to happen? And it got people thinking. Another significant event was uh, the Great Schism. So there was, at one point, there was uh, one of the, the, the emperors, one of the kings, he wanted to divorce his wife, but the Pope said, no, you can't do that. Uh, and, and he had that kind of power. And so <clears throat> eventually, um, he, he wanted to divorce his wife because she was barren, and the Pope refused to give him permission, so he decided to break away and start the Church of England and, and installed a new Pope. So. Okay, so this is a problem, right? So now we have the Pope. We have, or for years we've had, they, they had the Pope. For a thousand years or whatever it was, they had the Pope, and now all of a sudden they have two. And can you imagine the confusion that brought? So the Pope, with all of his power, uh, he was the vicar of Christ. He was the, the one that, that, that gave them access to Christ, basically. And so now there was two, and this created confusion and questions about, I think it kind of maybe started opening people's minds. <clears throat> so into that, uh, we have Martin Luther. Uh, John talked a little bit about him last night. He was a monk. He had a very sensitive conscience. Um, he talked about when he first served the, the, the communion meal that it, he almost freaked out as he thought about this actually being the body and blood of Christ. Uh, Luther was a very sincere person. He really was. Um, and I think in the beginning of his, his, his uh, movement, or whatever you want to call it, uh, he, he had a softer heart, maybe. He was very bold. He was very confident. Uh, but some of the things he said later on, as things didn't quite turn out the way he wanted them to, um, you wonder about him. <laughs> uh, he said things like, uh, well, okay, so <clears throat> I'll just leave it at that. Luther recognized some problems in the Catholic Church, and he was trying to correct them, all right? Um, so I don't know if we can quite imagine this, because you think about if the Catholic Church is your only hope of salvation, your only way to God, and now all of a sudden there's some other doctrines coming around, and there's some other people coming around, and then there's wars, and eventually Martin Luther controlled a certain area, and there was Protestant areas, and there was Catholic areas, and a lot of unrest, a lot of things were going on. Um, Martin Luther, he wanted reform, but he still retained the idea that the, the church and state were together. The church was territorial. So that's where eventually they had uh, you know, Protestant areas and Catholic areas and, and, and that type of thing. So in, in that time, it was really hard to fathom uh, an, a church that wasn't related to the, to the state. It was really hard to to even think about those kind of things. <clears throat> but anyway, Luther, he kind of opened Pandora's box and, and things uh, went sort of crazy. At one point, uh, there was the, the, the peasants uh, started uprising. So in, in their society, there was the wealthy and then there was the poor, and the poor worked for the wealthy. Uh, the, 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 uh, the lords, they had big estates and the, the poor people would work for them. There was probably almost no middle class. And so, as some of this started unraveling, uh, some of the, the, the peasants started uprising. They started rising up and saying, we won't put up for, with this anymore. They were quoting scripture. Um, and they, they were somewhat tied 
to Anabaptist ideas maybe, or they were uh, maybe saying some of the same things and it turned out to be bad for the Anabaptists eventually as well because they were tied to some of these things. But Luther one time said, stab, smite, throttle and slay these rabid mad dogs without mercy and without, with good conscience for nothing is more hurtful than a rebel. Luther was very impactful. He, he, he sort of opened the box, like I said. Um, so anyway, in all of this, uh, there's also another man named Zwingli. Zwingli was the leader of a church of the Grossmünster in Switzerland. Um, he, he was an interesting teacher, it seemed. He was very educated. He had a group of students, and they were studying the Bible together. And he decided that he wanted to put away with the, uh, the mass as they knew it and, and, and uh, follow a more biblical approach. And his students were involved, they were discussing these things, and he decided to, that he wanted to, to put away with it. Um, but he chose to take it to the authorities uh, and took it to the city council, and held a, they held a debate on the issue, and the city council said, no, we're going we're gonna to keep going as we've, as we've gone before. Um, so Zwingli accepted the ruling of the city council on how to do mass, but some of his followers, some of his, uh, his, the people who he, had, who he had been studying with said, no, we, we, we have to obey God rather than man. Conrad Grebel, Felix Mons, George Blaurock, uh, some of those, I'm not exactly sure if all of those were, were studying with Zwingli at the time, but some of them were studying with Zwingli, and they said, we, were, we are not going to follow what the city says, we are going to follow what God says. They were together, and George Blaurock um, asked Conrad Grebel, for God's sake, to baptize him with the true Christian baptism upon his faith and knowledge. Now, you say, what is the big deal about baptizing someone? If somebody from here would go out and baptize somebody else, we might say, well, maybe you weren't authorized to do that, or, you know, if you're not ordained, but it, 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 it's not, it, it would be a deal maybe, but not near as big a deal as it would have been in this time. Um, one writer says that Baptizing was the most revolutionary act of the Reformation. It was a revolutionary act. Uh, okay, and again, think of that. The church and the state are so tied together, and now we have some rogue person baptizing someone else. That is, that is, uh, that's not just outside of the church order. That's outside of the state's order. That is, that is uh, revolutionary. Uh, in terms, and not just revolutionary in thinking, this is a revolutionary act against the state, all right? Um, it was treason against the state, and it marked the beginning of the free church movement. Now, what's the free church movement? The free church movement is simply that we get to decide where we want to go to church, right? I mean, if you decide you don't like Weavertown, you can go to Ridgeview, or you can go somewhere else. Uh, you can, there, there's freedom. Uh, it's, the free, it's a free church. We can decide where we want to worship. Uh, this started uh, with, the, with the Anabaptists in, in 1500, somewhere there. Uh, it, this, the, and it started with baptizing, with rebaptizing people who had been baptized as infants. Um, it caused a lot of trouble, of course. Uh, several months, so the repercussions of baptism, there was a, a, a major spread. There was a lot. Uh, so the men who were at the head of this, they were very vocal. They would, they, they would evangelize. They would go out and teach. They would tell other people about this. Several months after his baptism, Conrad Grebel baptized 500 people on one occasion in a river. They went from house to house and witnessed about the new faith they discovered. Uh, a quote from Bender says, uh, the Anabaptists spread so rapidly that their teaching soon covered the land as it were. They soon gained a large following and baptized thousands, drawing to themselves many sincere souls who had a zeal for God. They increased so rapidly that the world feared an uprising by them. Now, there was a lot happening. They were, it seemed like the, 
it seems like some of the things we talked about earlier may have really uh, prepared the soil, prepared the way for these people to, for this new, for this new or old gospel message. Um, Zwingli was so frightened by the power of the movement that he complained that the struggle with the Catholic party was tub child's play compared to the conflict with the Anabaptists. Uh, this was a, a, a big deal. Here was people baptizing uh, uh, people. I mean, and, and this was, this was like I said, revolutionary. One third of the Netherlands were either Anabaptists or sympathizers to the Anabaptists at one point. Uh, what happened, there was a, a, there was a strong response from the state. The state uh, realized this was a threat to their power and they responded uh, with death sentences. Felix Mons was sentenced to death in 1527 because contrary to Christian order and custom, he had become involved in Anabaptism. He was drowned in the river. Uh, George Blarock was an interesting guy. He was uh, pretty bold. These guys were, were, were really bold. They said things that probably most of us wouldn't, wouldn't usually say. Um, but one day he went into a church and, uh, and didn't like what he was hearing, so he went, a Catholic church, and he went and took over the pulpit and said, this is actually my job, not this guy's job. And he started preaching. And that didn't go over very well. Um, <laughs> try it sometime. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, so they, they arrested him and then burned him at the stake. Well, you, what in the world? You know, that's amazing. Who would do that? But they, they knew their, their lives were on. But they had found something. They really had found something. And they really uh, were experiencing something real. Quote from Bender, as the Anabaptist movement continued to grow at exponential rates, religious authorities aligned with the state became increasingly alarmed. To stem the tide, Catholic, Lutheran, and Zwinglian authorities attempted to destroy the movement before it was too late. In 1529, this is just a few years after it started, okay? In 1529, the Diet of Spires, I'm not sure if that's the right way to say it, decreed that every Anabaptist and rebaptized person of either sex should be put to death by fire, sword, or some other way. It's quoted in Bender. Furthermore, in 1551, the Diet of Augsburg ordered that any judges who refused to pronounce the death sentence on Anabaptists should be removed from office. When authorities discovered the inadequacies of such hardline orders to stem the tide of Anabaptist growth, they moved to more aggressive means of annihilation. The authorities sent groups of armed executioners through the country to hunt down and execute any Anabaptists they found without trial or sentence. Bender describes the, these horrible events saying the most atrocious, ap, atrocious, atrocious application of this policy was made in Swabia, where the original 400 special police of, of 1528 sent against the Anabaptists proved too small a force and had to be increased to 1,000. They had 1,000 people hunting Anabaptists and just killing them. Um, an imperial provost marshal served as a chief administrator of this bloody program in Swabia and other regions until he finally broke down in terror and dismay and after an execution in Brixen, lifted his hands to heaven and swore a solemn oath never again to put to death an Anabaptist, which vow he kept. Now, As I said, there was a lot going on. There was a lot of resistance. There was a lot of persecution. There was also a lot of confusion. So uh, we like to think that the Anabaptist movement was just this great, you know, perfect <laughs> movement that they got everything right, and you know, they really need, and and it spread really fast. But at the same time, there was a lot of radical ideas going around. Uh, there was actually a group of them. Uh, who took over a city and they're going to set up their kingdom. <laughs> the kingdom of heaven was going to, was going to be real now. Uh, and they, they protected it and they armed themselves and, and they, got, they became really radical uh, to the point where eventually the authorities, the, 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 I don't even know, it was the Catholics or who it was, came in and took over the city and, and drove the people out or killed them. And they hung three of the leaders in baskets up on the church, whatever, steeple, somewhere up in there. And those, they say those cages still remain there today. Um, but that, things like that really gave the Anabaptist people a bad name. Uh, so 
there was crazy things like that going on, and then they were associated, plus the Peasants' Revolt, and some of those things got tied to the Anabaptists, who really who didn't want, even the, even the ones who didn't want to live that way, who knew that it wasn't Jesus' way, they sort of got tied in with some of those, those uh, threats, those real threats to the state. Um, Man of Simons was a priest. He was ordained a priest in 1524, had a really nice life. Um, he questioned whether the bread and wine actually turned into the body and blood of the Lord. He says he was really a stupid preacher. <laughs> he says uh, he had never touched the scriptures. He was afraid if he, let, he read them, he would be misled. This is in his words. You see what a stupid preacher I was for almost two years. And he, would, he says he would sit with his friends and they would talk about the scriptures and he had no idea. Whenever he would say something, they would all laugh at him because he had no idea what he was talking about. And finally, he heard about Munster and it seems like possibly his brother was involved in the Munster revolution. Uh, and, and he, it, it really moved him to start studying the scripture. And he finally opened the scripture. Uh, good idea if you're gonna be a priest. Um, he started studying the scripture and he discovered that the things that the Catholic Church were practicing were not according to the scripture. Uh, and he eventually became a really strong leader in the Anabaptist movement. Um, he, was, he was in the northern area. He would have been more in the Netherlands in that area. So he had a huge influence uh, in the north. So really quickly, the northern regions where, of Anabaptism uh, didn't face persecution for a, near as long as the southern Swiss areas. So our people would have come more from the Swiss, the Alsace areas, and in some of those areas, they faced persecution for 200 or 250 years. The stories are just uh, unbelievable. The, the things that they went through were 200, can you imagine, 250 years? That's almost as long as our country's in existence. Uh, that's how long the persecution lasted, uh, to the point where they would get exiled from the area, or if, if, if someone was discovered to be an Anabaptist, they might take their farm away from them, take their children away from them. It just went on and on and on for 200 or 250 years. Um, there's way too much we could talk about, but... Where, uh, what else should we say? <laughs> what made what stop? The, the movement. Uh, what made the persecution stop? Wow. Uh, I think, I'm not sure. Eventually, I guess they got tired of it, or like, I, I'm not sure. And another example is the Hutterites. The Hutterites were living in Prussia, I think it was, between the Ottomans. Oh, the other thing I should have mentioned, the Ottomans were another huge uh, a, a big, big thing that was threatening the, the, the Europe at that time. The Ottoman Empire, they were the Muslims, and they would invade Europe occasionally. And so there was this real sense that any time the Muslims could come and take over Europe. And, and it, was, it was very real, a real sense that this could happen. But anyway, so the, the, uh, the Hutterites had a community of around 20,000 people. This was after the persecution died down, died down some. They developed a, a community of, I think, 20,000 people. And they had their, you know, how they, they have their communes or whatever. And, <clears throat> and during the Thirty Years' War, the Thirty Years' War was basically fought over, over trying to figure out which, which Christian sect is going to control, you know, certain areas. Uh, and they fought for 30 years over this. And finally, at the end of it, they said, okay, you, you Protestants, you can have your area and we'll have Catholic areas. And that's how they... That's how, they, um, that's how they settled it. But there was no space for Anabaptists even then. But the Hutterites lived uh, between the Ottomans and I don't know if it was the Protestants or the Catholics. And they would get, they, would, they were in between both. And so sometimes they refused to go to war. And so the, the Europeans would come and, and invade them and, and take their animals and take their, then kill, their, their, kill, kill them. And, carry, and then the Ottomans would come and carry them into captivity and they would, uh, in, one, in one raid, they took like 250 uh, Hutterites captive into the Ottoman Empire. Um, and some of those stories are just incredible. They basically decimated the entire Hutterite community. Eventually, there was about 100 of them left, and a lot of them reintegrated into the Catholic Church, and then some of them eventually ended up in America. Um, <clears throat> but the, the, the things that they faced were, were very significant. 
Um, what else? <laughs> Someone else. Maybe you have some things to say. I wasn't terribly prepared for this. Somebody can fill in the details. Uh, yes. So some of the Anabaptists went to Russia. How did that happen? They, they went to Russia to escape persecution and were promised, uh, they were promised immunity from, from uh, going to war perpetually, but that ended then after a while. I forget the details of how that, how that happened. They went from the north, they went from the Netherlands, from that area to Russia. Uh, and that would be the, the German Baptists. And then when things kind of got tight there, they, they left and some of them came to America, some of them ended up in, in uh, Mexico and different places. Which groups? Uh, yeah, the German, the, the, the Mennonites that went to Russia would have been originally, but then eventually they, so what happened is the Catherine the Great, I think her name was, she gave them land and they became very successful, but they were all, they were in their own area, in their own community. And they were completely isolated from, from other people, from other Russians. And they basically developed a state church, in a sense. I mean, it was a territorial church again. And, uh, and the church leaders had to, you know, had to administer corporal punishment and things like that. So that, that became a bit problematic. And then they had some revivals and things happened. I don't, yeah. yeah. Uh, Conrad Grebel? Mm hmm Well, that's, that's one way to look at it. I think there's different ways to look at it. I mean, that's sort of the story, but you know, like, it seems like there was a lot going on. And that's, that's the story that we use to, sort of to identify the start. Uh, there was probably, it's probably more complicated than that, but yeah. I'm sure there's a lot more we could say. I think, I, I think the American side of Anabaptist history is very fascinating as well and the things that have influenced us and how it's changed us and made us a little bit funny. So thank you. I hope that was helpful in some way.